Don Masella here again for Small Business Digest. We have a guest uh, that I've been looking forward for a couple of weeks uh, having on. Jennifer Moorhead here to talk about uh, what, what's coming up in the future. Jennifer, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, as we ask all our guests, first, Jennifer, tell us a little bit about yourself personally, then about your company, and finally, a website where people can learn more. Oh, thank you. So my name is Jennifer Moorhead. My background has been in sales and marketing before I came to Flex HR, but I've always been in the business of managing people, managing teams so they can achieve the best outcomes for a company. So I worked in media sales up until 2010 and managed a sales department for a large media company. And then I started my own business. It was a marketing business that I ran for 10 years from 2010 to 2020 and then sold. And then at the end of 2020, I was able to acquire a, an HR and payroll outsourcing company that also does recruiting and HR consulting called Flex HR. And I was able to acquire it from its original founder his name is Jim Sachansky. He and I work very well together. And so he's still a part of our company. And Flex HR then has been in business since 2001. So we're on our 22nd year, and I'm going now on my third year as its owner and CEO. Okay. Your website? Flex HR is at www.f, like flexible, F L E X hr.com so it's flexhr.com it's spelled out like my logo above here and what we do we partner with companies all across the country and they might have three employees they might have 3,000 employees we do HR administration on the back end for them called HR outsourcing where we work with them remotely to process new hires and process offboarding and to help with benefits and to help with their open enrollment. So that's that HR outsourcing piece. The payroll outsourcing is we take over their payroll and manage it for them. And that on both ends for HR and for payroll, it's so beneficial to outsource it because it's confidential from people in the organization. So, you know, people in your own organization then don't know salary figures, salary amounts, because we're taking care of it. And if you have, you know, something that's of issue with a manager and a direct report or within the employee group, our HR managers will step in and help. And so that's very, very beneficial to a company. In addition, if someone leaves on a dime, we always have some, you know, for the company, they're in a lurch, right? To find another HR manager on their own or another payroll manager. They don't have to worry about that when they come to a flex HR. We have plenty of incredibly talented HR managers and payroll managers. In addition to that, we'll do recruitment on an hourly basis, which is very powerful because it's not taking a percentage of a whole year salary. It's just here is our hourly rate for recruiting. And this is how we're going to achieve getting people hired. And then that can also then go dormant at certain times of the year when you don't need the recruiting. And then we do HR consulting. So it's strategy HR consulting to help put together a performance review plan to help activate modules within a payroll system to make sure you're optimizing them. It might be to do an HR audit. So those are kind of the, the places we cover HR outsourcing, payroll outsourcing, recruiting, and then HR consulting. Okay. So we know a lot of what you're doing. And uh, our, as you know, our audience is primarily made up of, of small, smaller businesses, usually under 50 employees, but up. Uh, what are some of the things you're seeing uh, in, in this year? Yeah, so, you know, and the bread and butter of what we do is with clients who are 50 employees or fewer. So there are some particular challenges with that type, right? 
when you're running a company with fewer than 50 employees, every single employee is incredibly critical to, you know, what you're doing. And so it's, you know, I'm sure that your um, followers, your listeners are seeing and we're seeing, um, you know, wages have gone up in many different job roles. Wages have gone up 20%, 30%. So that doesn't just get to happen right away for business owners, right? That's really hard to figure out and figure out the cash flow and to take incremental steps. So we do recommend, you know, if you're sitting there, it's January 2023, and you are getting, you know, pinged by employees saying, I want to raise, I want to do this. We would recommend in those cases, you know, putting that together and putting together kind of what you could do with that raise, but you could even um, push that out. You know, this might happen in July or this might happen in October. And that keeps them happy. Usually if you're really communicative about, Hey, we want to get you more responsibilities and we want to get you more money, but that takes time for us as a business to figure out how to put that together. And so we would recommend that type of strategy. I do think, you know, it is very, very hard to retain employees in general right now. So if you are putting together, you know, your org chart and thinking through it, I think kind of micro promotions are really important right now because employees are demanding growth in their companies. They're demanding, you know, like a, a bigger title, even if you can do that on a micro level with a micro raise that might meet their need. And you can even do it where you're giving them that information now but then it won't hit your bottom line until July. So that's something that, you know, we've seen that can help with companies, 50 employees or smaller. I think we're seeing people resigning with no notice across the board, even in professional services industries. Um, and that's hard. That's hard for a business of any size, but particularly a smaller business where everyone matters. And so I think people need to prepare for it. If, you know, you don't have a bench running, you need to get one. You need to do extra recruiting before you know someone's left and do a real assessment of your job, your employees to say, who do we think is going to leave and how are we making sure that this will be backfilled quickly? Because I think the expectation has to shift to we're not going to get any notice, right? They're going to say I'm resigning today. And in some cases that might be better because they might have stayed for two weeks, but was that really the best work that they're doing, you know, for you? Probably not. So in some cases that's better, but you have to be ready then to backfill those positions. Um, I think employee learning is a huge priority. So setting it up where even if you can have people internally do some additional, um, you know, teachings for the people within your organization, that's a big requests that we're seeing from employees across the board. We want to get more out of the job and more learning and on the job learning. People don't want to do the baptism by fire where they would get put in a role and, you know, they're going to leave and it's going to be hard to replace them. So try to work backwards, you know, in that and make sure that you have the right training put together. So those are some ideas for this future that we see in, in 2023. Also, um, you know, hybrid versus remote versus in the office. We're seeing a lot of demand. You know, there are certain nurses have to be at a hospital. Teachers need to be in a school for the most part. Um, but in certain cases, if you are an industry that can allow employees to be at home or to do that on a hybrid basis, you know, that's a huge demand from employees. It's also really hard to do. It's hard to manage appropriately. And, you know, so it's thinking about how do we live life as a company in the office? And if we are kind of being forced to do be doing that in a hybrid mode or even in a remote first mode, how do we adapt that? So training can take longer. You definitely need a Teams or a Zoom and, and to have the person who's learning drive the screen so that the person who's training can be sure that they're understanding it correctly. 
You have to think through then the technology implications of a hybrid workforce because you need to have a desktop at the office and a laptop at home that you're providing and the IT support to do all that. So that becomes more expensive um, for a company, for an employer. I let mean, me, I can go on and on. <laughs> let, let me inter interrupt you. Um, I don't know if you saw um, last week, and I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, that there seems to be a divide coming on. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're getting reports about the, 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 the massive layoffs in the tech industry and other industries, which has uh, profoundly affected. I went to a, um, uh, a bar where I hung out young people. I'm not young, so I stood out like a, a sore thumb and listened to their... Uh, there seems to be a, this gen, this is the first generation that's facing uh, the losses of jobs on the scale that we're seeing today. And uh, are you seeing any effect on that in any of your, or is this too early? Um, you know, we are primarily on the East Coast and the Midwest, and we're based in Atlanta and Chicago. So we're not seeing as much of those effects because I think that that's hit the West Coast um, the most with the tech jobs. Although, you know, we can see that too um, in Atlanta and Chicago and some of the East Coast markets that we're working in. I do think, um, you know, we have a client with about 3,000 employees based in New York that has gone through quite a few layoffs. I think what happened there is that there was some lazy hiring going on, right? They were willing to provide these crazy salaries, crazy benefits packages that were never sustainable. They were never going to be sustainable for the business, right? And so then we hit a blip in the economy and poof, those jobs go out the, the door. So I think also employees need to be very careful in their, you know, is if, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, right? It might have worked for six months or eight months, but you do want to look at a company and how responsible they're being in their hiring. Um, you know, I think that this is definitely going to be something where, you know, there will be this blip and it'll probably stay for two to four to six years, right? And so, you know, you're not going to be, those those employees aren't going to find those salaries and find those benefits packages in in that same capacity. And they might have to extend into some other, um, you know, pieces of what they do to find a different job. Now those jobs are out there, right? There are plenty of jobs out there. We have a, a you know, there are so many jobs that haven't been able to be filled in certain markets. And so I think it's about retooling and looking at your skill set and thinking about, you know, what would be best. And then making sure that from the employee's perspective, when you're interviewing and looking at that job offer, take a look very closely, right? If it feels like it's too good to be true, it probably is. And, you know, make sure that you're, you're going to a company, you look into the finances as much as you can, or ask questions about what is the longevity? Is there an expected longevity? I think some of those tech companies, they didn't care. They just wanted, you know, butts and seats, right? And, but to the employee, they care. And in a lot of cases, if they're from a different country, that has huge implications on their home and home life as well. Well, uh, it's an interesting point because um, uh, I had someone else on this program who said uh, uh, smaller companies tend to be more um, uh, choosy in, in what they paid and who they, and who they paid than uh, larger companies. And I, I haven't heard that expression, lazy hiring. I have to steal that from you because I think it's a great line. But um, uh, as I say, um, a, a smaller company, before they make a commitment, really look at, do, A, do they need the person? And B, how much can they pay? So do you think that um, uh, they're going to be better able to, to um, succeed and well, whether this downturn um, because of that? Do I think smaller companies will succeed in weather the downturn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely do. I think, um, especially, you know, it depends on the industry, right? Um, I think companies with, you know, I, I do think, you know, that 
in smaller companies, you're going to have leadership that is looking very closely at cash flow. You're going to have leadership that's very closely looking at, you know, these contracts affect this hiring, you know, and, but that's not a, a tried, you know, a hard and fast rule, right? So when employees are interviewing with those smaller companies, they need to ask a lot of questions, potential employees, they need to ask, you know, is what is the background here? What what are your thoughts for growth? I think that's really, really important to ask because for potential employees, you know, this is a big, you know, you don't want to be taking a risk that you don't know you're taking, right? You want to, you know, have the expectation, you, you know, that like this is for the long haul, if that's what you want. Now, from the company standpoint, I think definitely, I think, you know, but if you're a company that's overhired or done lazy recruiting, done lazy hiring, that's going to, that's going to show, you know, let's say a couple of clients drop off and you don't see that, that growth as much and you're not able to replace it. Or, you know, if you see some things changing in the future, that's going to be tricky and you're going to tr need to try to get ahead of that. And so, you know, in certain cases that might really work to your favor, the fact that it's kind of easy for people to quit right now, you know? Mm -hmm. So if people are quitting on you, maybe you're not backfilling those positions and that's how you're managing your cash flow. So I think there are a couple ways that you can approach it, but I do think that smaller businesses are, you know, set up better, uh, but you know, it can't be a one-off for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know the financial health of everyone out there. You know, I don't know the types of parameters that they choose to track change in their organization. If they're really looking at key performance indicators on a close basis, or they're kind of just winging it, like, we'll see, you know, and what type of forecasting models they're putting together. But I think for the most part, it's at what we've seen and in our clients, they've been fine. Well, um, Jennifer, your, your, your company and your website again? FlexHR, www.flexhr.com. Okay. Well, Jennifer, uh, uh, someone brought this up. So a lot of companies, particularly in the small, smaller companies, took out loans, took government loans and other things to keep uh, employ, employees employed. Um mm -hmm. Uh, is there any residual loyalty uh, for them doing that that you've seen? Residual loyalty for the employees to the employer or for the employer for the government? No, an employee to the employer. Employer, uh, what is it, 70, 73,000 small companies took out loans uh, to keep employees employed. Um have you seen anything uh, to indicate that um, as as things have gotten worse, there's been a loyalty on some of these people? No, I would say absolutely not. I think this is a huge issue with employees right now. There's very little loyalty from the employee to the company. It's the employees in most industries and, you know, our tech industry and tech jobs might be different than this. But in a lot of industries, employees have opportunities that they've never had before. They might have two or three job offers coming at them that they've never had that. And so this is a, a very low time in terms of loyalty to the employer or to the company. I would not have any expectation around loyalty from employees in pretty much any and every industry. Uh, so uh, are you seeing the breakdown where employees have uh, worked for the same smaller company for 20 or 30 years? Or uh, um, uh, I'm asking about that because um, it, it came up in a discussion last week. Um, so, you know, p people staying w with companies uh, because uh, a smaller company tend to um, uh uh, in instances that I've seen where there's been sickness or other things, they've tended to be uh, more flexible with the employee. But none of that is, uh, is turning out to be loyalty is what I'm hearing you say. I think employers are doing everything they can to keep employees happy. 
Um, but this is a time I think employees have skyrocketing childcare costs. Employees, you know, we lost a lot of our baby boomers earlier than we thought from COVID. And that's been very disruptive. And so all of that has combined into the fact where in a lot of industries and for a lot of positions, we don't have enough U.S. employees for the slots that are open in a lot of cities and geographies. And so it just means that, you know, the employee can very much call their own shots now. Mm -hmm. They could go out and become their own boss. They could start an LLC and do, you know, micro level consulting and not have to have the responsibilities of a 40 hour a week employee, a W-2 employee. Um, there are just, I think, a lot more options for the employee than there ever has been. Um, so that I think that's really tested the bonds of loyalty to the company. Hmm. Well, uh, um, in your opinion, and maybe you don't want to give it, uh, who ben who's benefited more from this, the employer or the employee? 100% the employee. So you're saying that it's more difficult for the employer today? Absolutely. You know, when everyone is coming into an office, you get a lot of control, right? You you see them, you see who's coming early, you see who's coming late, you see who's kind of leading the discussions. Now, in certain cases, you're getting people who will resign if they don't work 100% remotely and you don't have someone to fill that role. And so they're working remotely, that's fine. You have much less control. You have much less control when it's remote. And, you know, what are they doing all day? You know, do we know that they're doing anything all day? So then you have to put everything into place, technology usually, to help you manage that and manage through that. And there are solutions, there are techniques that you can use, but that it's usually going to be more costly. Um, now it works itself out. Maybe you have less space in your office or no overhead of an office and you transfer that to a technology solution to manage it. But it just means more work for the employer. You know, recruiting has become more expensive. People are leaving positions with no notice and that's hard on client relationships. So 100% the current um, status of where we are is in the employee's favor and not in the employer's. Well, uh, there's also another issue. If you put something on an uh, employer's employee's uh, computer in, in their home that to tell you tell you how they're working, you're invading their privacy, and that's going to be, a, I think, a, a big issue over the next uh, few couple of years. Yeah, I do. I think you know. So you can put it in your handbook to talk about kind of what you use and you have to make sure to provide a work laptop. You know, it could never, that technology could not be put on a private laptop. And then they would need to sign off, acknowledge that, you know, they're okay with that, you know, because that is the, the company's property and that's the company's intellectual property. But I agree with you. I think it will come up in, you know, legislation and be contested. Well, we only have a couple of minutes uh, left, uh, Jennifer. But first, uh, tell us again your website and then what would you like to leave our audience with? It's FlexHR, www.flexhr.com. We'd be very excited for any of your audience members. If you need HR or payroll solutions, we'd be happy to work with you and can take a real customized approach because we know, especially with smaller businesses, you know, everyone is different. Every, you know, company and business has its own story. And so we love, we love our clients and we'd love to work with you. Well, let me ask you this question. Have you uh, have these problems cropped up in, in your own company? Definitely. Absolutely. I have myself in our company, we have 24 employees and I have 28 1099 consultants. And so a lot of these have, have cropped up. I do approach staffing and my employees with a layered approach. And so that's why I have W-2 employees. And I also have 
quite a few 1099s because people like to work in different ways. And our 1099s, they, you know, don't want a manager and they don't want a one-on-one every week and they don't want the parameters of a business, but they, you know, they run their own businesses. That's what qualifies them as a 1099. And we, you know, collaborate on a few different clients, but then of course they don't receive benefits from us and certain, you know, I think pros that a W-2 employee gets from working with us, but it helps to have both and to take that layered approach. And that's, I I think, a huge um, takeaway from kind of where we are, because I think more employees are switching over, like I was mentioning, to do even micro consulting. So we could hire a W-2 full-time payroll manager. We could also work with someone who loves doing payroll for clients, but wants to work on as a payroll consultant and works with various clients. Well, on that note, uh, Jennifer Moorhead, we say thank you so much for, for, for me and illuminating time. I hope uh, our audience does as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, we appreciate you.